Newberg, and I'm reading creative nonfiction. My piece is titled New Girl. So how do you like all the new girl's piercings? Bill obviously wants me to validate his phobia of all things different from what his normal <coughs> Mormon town produces. I glance over at Ashley, who's on the phones for the first time. She does look scary. I fully expect anyone with two lip rings, a tongue bar, three eyebrow piercings, and ear gauges to beat me up on the spot. The dark, heavy eyeliner doesn't help either. She's on your sales team, though, Bob. I'd hate to be you. It's getting uncomfortably close to five years since I was the new girl in a different call center. But I can still remember the feeling. I remember because of Bailey. I'd been on the phones for only a few days when she really made me aware of her existence. I leave for a couple of days, and when I come back, that is sitting in my chair. She was talking to a supervisor, not me. I was that. I'm sorry, I'll move, I mumbled as I gathered my things and found a seat in the farthest corner. I spent the next year in that corner. Ashley is sitting in the corner again. She has to move closer as the rest of the newbies did when they finished training. Her jet black lined eyes flash with suspicion every time I come by to see how she's doing with the phones. Why don't you come join us by the manager desks? We're having a Christmas coloring contest. I smile, hoping it looks inviting and encouraging. No thanks, I like the quiet. It's the longest sentence she said yet. I walk back to my desk, frustrated. I will never get through to this new room. I'm not sure how management noticed me in my corner. They certainly never asked me to leave until they needed a new editor. I was thrilled with this chance to finally leave. Then I found out who the other new editor was. Baby. The first time I worked with her, I tried to be friendly. She didn't reciprocate. You were homeschooled, weren't you? Her tone was snide. Yeah, how'd you know? I could tell. Amber told you, didn't she? Yeah, I would have been able to tell anyway. You're so socially inept. It was the wrong thing to say to an insecure 19-year-old. I became mute when Bailey was around, even if I was talking to someone else when she walked into the room. I'm not looking forward to this conversation. I'm supposed to give Ashley a written warning because her performance has dropped significantly since she first started. Maybe she won't say much, Bill encourages. And that's what I'm afraid of. I hug my binder tightly to my waist as Ashley follows me into the manager office. I want to talk to her before she sees the paper on top. It feels like it's burning through my blocks. How are you feeling about the job so far? I fake a smile. Silence. Okay. How's life in general? I glance down at the accusing paper. When I look up, it's obvious that Ashley's wild winner isn't one of them. Thanks. Okay, I'm Heidi Williams, and I'll be reading <coughs> uh, pieces from my creative nonfiction called Crying Rape. As a rape victim advocate, I teach people how important it is to trust the survivor, to believe their story, and not to question for a second that they are making it up. Those first moments of coming forward are crucial. Their emotions are overwhelming and what they're going through is terrifying. I speak at domestic violence community awareness events about believing the victim and doing all you can do to put the rapist where he or she belongs, in jail. But what if the victim is making it up? This is the dilemma I face when a longtime friend texted me to say, my mom just told me that my dad molested me as a child. My gut, despite my love for her, told me that she was making a false accusation. For the last few years, this friend's life has changed drastically for the worst. Her mother had a midlife crisis, tried to commit suicide, left her father, and took all seven kids with her to Hawaii to pursue a relationship with her scuba instructor there. She tried extremely hard to get full custody of her kids. Carrie's entire world had been torn apart. She went from being a little Mormon girl who didn't watch PG-13 movies to a young adult who's sending pictures of herself smoking a bong the size of a small child. <laughs> Everything she once believed in had been shattered into a million confusing pieces. She sent me angry, heartbreaking poems she'd written, vividly painting her hatred towards her dad. She loathed him for marrying another woman, blamed him for their leaving, accused him, for him of not loving her anymore, and despised everything he believed in. Her anger was evident. Frankly, I didn't blame her for being better towards life. I babysat Kara and her siblings through all my junior high and high school years. I literally saw her grow up, as well as her younger six brothers and sisters. James and Belinda, her mother and father, would call me to stay at their house while they went on dates or to therapy. My number one job as a sitter was to listen to Kira's worries about her parents. 
even when she was old enough to watch her younger brothers and sisters, she would talk to me regularly. She confided in me. She trusted me. And I loved her as if she were my, younger, my little sister. The desire to accept her words as truth killed me. I knew what it was like to have people not believe sexual assault victims. I wanted to accept her allegation. I longed to lend my support as a friend, but it didn't matter. I simply could not believe her. It was far too convenient. Her mom was trying to stay in Hawaii and nothing was falling in her favor. Then all of a sudden, Kira was molested as a child? I went against what I taught as a survivor of rape and refused to believe the testimony. In fact, I felt so strongly about speaking against her ca cases like this, I literally testified in court against her claim. I refused to stand by and witness a false accusation of sexual assault. It might not be my place to judge, but I felt like I knew too much on both sides of the spectrum. I had met countless survivors whose experiences deserved true justice. It would have been a disgrace to their stories and my own if I didn't follow my gut instinct to speak out. Am I wrong to stand up for something I believe, even though it goes against something else I believe? I feel contradictory, but I think I did what's right. I hope I did what's right.